Well, we're continuing through the story, and this is our study of the Bible in chronological order. We do have some copies of the book, The Story, still available. If you'd like to get your copy, we ask for a $5 donation, but we'd rather have you just have your own copy so you can follow along if you don't have $5. And we've been looking lately at a section of scripture that are called the prophets. And we've looked at some of the different prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And this week we're going to be in the book of Daniel, looking at some things out of the prophecy of Daniel. But we're not going to focus so much on Daniel because probably most of us are familiar with him more so than some of the, the other folks in the Bible. I mean, we've heard of Daniel in the lion's den and the, the fiery furnace and all those stories. But what we're going to do today is we are going to focus on a man who was the king of Babylon during the time when Daniel was a prophet. And his name is Nebuchadnezzar. So let's turn our Bibles together to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel is in the Old Testament. We're going to be camping out there in chapter 4 today. And while you're looking that up, I want to share with you a story about a book that was published in 1964. This is a true book. It was published, and it's titled The Three Christs of y Ypsilanti. And The Three Christs of Ypsilanti told the case story uh, that took place in our own home state here in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where Dr. Milton Rokich shares about three patients of his who had these illusions of grandeur. In fact, they had such illusions of grandeur that they literally believed they were God in the flesh. They thought they were the Messiah come to save the world of its sins. And so he's telling the story of these three patients of his and, and how he tried to bring them to reality. Uh, and, and help these three guys named Leon, Clyde, and Joseph come to the realization that there is a God, but they are not him. So one of the strategies that he used that's described in this book to bring them to reality is he had these three men spend a lot of time together, actually live together for a couple of years, and so they would sleep in the same room, they would eat at the same table, they would share in the same group therapy sessions, and his hopes were that as they interacted with one another, they would see each of them, oh, these other two are claiming that they're God. Wait, there can't be three gods, right? So he was hoping that would kind of wake them up to reality. Well, unfortunately, it didn't work. It just led to a lot of chaos and confusion. For instance, they'd be in a group therapy session together, and one of them would say in the presence of the other two, I've been sent here by God to save the world. I'm the Messiah. And Dr. Rokishi would ask him, well, how do you know that? And then he'd say, well, because God told me so. And then he'd no less get finished with his statement. And one of the other two guys would say, I never said no such thing. <laughs> and so they start arguing with one another, right? And, and it just kind of led to chaos and confusion and they continued just living in this alternate reality where they thought the universe was all about them, that life centered all around them. Now think about this for a moment. If, if that's all it takes to be considered crazy, then probably a lot of us ought to be committed, right? Because we oftentimes live the same way, where we think that the universe is all about us and life should just center around our, our lives. And if you look at the way that we treat people, or if you look at the control issues we have, you know, how we always need to be in charge, it sure seems like oftentimes we are confused about these issues of who is God, you know, and who is really supposed to be the one in control. As we study King Nebuchadnezzar, he is a case study on what it means to think of yourself as God, because he was certainly full of himself. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about idolatry. And we've seen that idolatry is when you put anything or anyone else in place of God in your life, right? And so we tend to think of idolatry as this antiquated, irrelevant sin of the past. It's not something that applies to us anymore. But what we've discovered is really it is pretty prevalent in our culture today and in our lives. And no, we may not have golden images 
that we bow down to and worship every day, but there are all kinds of substitutes we put in God's place, aren't there? And there are things that we look to to save us instead of Jesus. I mean, it might be money or it might be sex or it might be power or success or entertainment or food. The list goes on and on, the substitutes we try to put in place of Jesus in our life. But here's what I want us to see as we talk today. The base foundation for all of these false gods that try to buy for our attention is really me. Not me, but you. You know what I'm saying? It's that, that idea of me instead of the mission. And, and, and the invitation of each of these idols <clears throat> that buy for our attention is that you can worship yourself if that's what you want to do. And so we end up putting ourselves in the place of God in our lives. And we decide we're going to be the one who's in control. We're the one who's going to be in charge. And the thing is, God takes that very, very seriously. King Nebuchadnezzar was a man who thought of himself as God. Now you will recall, we've already looked at this. The nation of Israel split, split into two kingdoms, right? You have the northern kingdom consisting of the ten tribes. And they were destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And then you have the two southern kingdoms, uh, southern tribes making up the southern kingdom called Judah. And they were wiped out later by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And whenever Nebuchadnezzar conquered a nation, one of the things that he would do is he would take the best and the brightest from the land and he would force them to serve as his personal attendants. They were his slaves, so to speak, and, and they served him at his pleasure. One of the young men taken from Jerusalem in the southern kingdom at the time of its downfall was Daniel. And Daniel was probably 15 or 16 years old at the time, but he was very smart, and the people recognized this, and so Daniel was sent to serve this foreign king of Babylon King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, he had all the power in the Mediterranean world at the time. No one was more feared than him. And he is this graphic example of what life looks like when we put ourselves on the throne of our heart instead of God. There's also a prophet during this time by the name of Ezekiel, and he was a contemporary of Daniel, actually. And Ezekiel paints this picture of what it means to replace God in our life. And so in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 2, he says, In the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of God. But you are a mere man, Ezekiel says. He says, you are not God, though you think you are as wise as a God. In other words, Ezekiel says, there is a God and you are not him. Now, you wouldn't think we need to be reminded of that, but that's how we live, isn't it? Think about how we spend our money or how we interact with other people, and sometimes it sure seems like we've got everything confused and our priorities mixed up. So Ezekiel puts it very clearly to Nebuchadnezzar and to us. He says, you are not God. I think increasingly, this is a lesson that our culture needs to learn. In his book, Gods of War, Kyle Eidelman tells about a psychological test that has been given for decades, and it's called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. This test involves a person who answers questions, uh, basically responds to statements that are made on a scale of one to five, and you have to rate yourself on how much that statement applies to you, whether you think it's true or not. So for instance, one of the comments would be something like, if I ruled the world, it would be a better place. And if you believe that, you know, you would rate yourself on a scale of one to five. Or maybe there's a statement like, I think that I'm a special person. And if you think that's true, you rate yourself highly on that. If not so true, you know, on that scale of one to five. Or I can live any way I want to and nobody can tell me what to do, right? Or I can be anything that I want to be. If I really work at it, you rate yourself on a scale of one to five by how true you think that is for your life. And here's what psychologists have noted as this test has been conducted over the decades. They have noted that there is this growing mentality among people in recent years that says no one can tell me what to do. I am the center of my world. And there seems to be this increasing 
understanding and outlook of life from that perspective. In fact, one of the psychologists, a professor from San Diego State University, explained that part of the problem that is leading to this, it, it, this mentality in our society is that increasingly we are raising our children in an environment where we tell them they're special. But we don't talk to them about the shared responsibility they have towards other people. And you know, when you live in a world where all you're told is that you're special, but nobody ever tells you about the shared responsibility you have to other people, it creates these narcissistic tendencies. And they gave as an example a preschool curriculum where all the students begin each day singing to the tune of Farah Jaka, I am special, I am special, look at me, look at me. And they start out every day singing that song. Now let me just ask you, if you start out every day looking in the mirror and saying, I am special, look at me, do you think that that's going to create some problems down the road for you? let alone for the people around you who know you, right? That was Nebuchadnezzar's favorite song. And he would stand up on the rooftop of his palace and he would just belt it out. He was the king of Babylon. He wanted everybody to know it. Now, in case you didn't know, Babylon was located in modern day Iraq. Do you remember the name of the former dictator of Iraq? Saddam Hussein. But here's something I bet you didn't know about him. Did you know that he took on a nickname for himself? He gave himself a, a nickname. His nickname was Successor to Nebuchadnezzar. That is the title that Saddam Hussein wanted to be known by, Successor to Nebuchadnezzar, which tells you something about Nebuchadnezzar because these guys had a lot in common and it wasn't good. For instance, in Jeremiah chapter 37, we read about Nebuchadnezzar capturing the king of Judah and his family. And then what he does is he proceeds to put to death each member of, of the king of Judah's family right in front of him. And after the last son is killed, they pluck out the eyes of the king so that the last impression on his mind was his family perishing in front of him. Wouldn't that be terrible? There's another place in the Bible where we read after another king was appointed over Judah, he rebelled, and Nebuchadnezzar came in and took him out, and he roasted him over a fire to death. And so, this is an evil man. This is not a good man. Nebuchadnezzar was a tyrant, and you would not want to mess with him. And so he captures the southern kingdom, and he destroys Jerusalem in a brutal, violent way. Now, when we get to Daniel chapter 4, we see that it is spoken as in the voice of King Nebuchadnezzar. And in light of his cruel nature, it's kind of shocking, really, to read what he says. Look at Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Again, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, right? King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. This is King Nebuchadnezzar now. It's like he's become a worship leader and he's writing these praise songs. This Saddam Hussein type of character is now singing songs to the Lord. And it's like you're thinking, what in the world happened? What, what changed? It'd be like waking up in the morning and all of a sudden, Howard Stern, or, or that outspoken atheist Richard Dawkins is calling our nation to revival and repentance, right? You'd be like, wait a second, what's going on here? And Nebuchadnezzar, he begins chapter 4 by praising the Lord and giving glory to God. And you're like, wow, this doesn't fit with anything that I know about this man. So Nebuchadnezzar tells about how he learned a very painful lesson that there is a God, and he is not him. In Daniel chapter four, verses four and five, Nebuchadnezzar tells about being at home. He's content, and he's prosperous, and he has no fears, and he's got this huge army all around him protecting him, right? Archaeologists have dug up his palace. He had a 630,000 square foot palace that he lived in. But then the real God decides to pay him a visit, and he has this dream, and this dream just terrified him. 
Look at what it says in verse 4. Nebuchadnezzar was at home. Uh, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous, and I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So the, the king dreams of this fabulous tree. It's fruitful, the birds of the air nest in it, the animals of the field, they, they lie under it in shelter. But then in Daniel chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, Nebuchadnezzar says, In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. And he called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Now seven times might be a reference to seven years in, in the Bible. Seven also means complete. And so the message here is that God is giving Nebuchadnezzar is that until he figures this out, this is what's, what it's going to be like. This is what's going to happen until he figures it out. So Nebuchadnezzar knows that this isn't just an average dream, right? There is something going on here, and he's trying to figure out what it all means. And so he calls in his court magicians, and he calls in his interpreters, and he explains this dream to them. And he says, he asks them, what does this thing mean? But nobody knows. And eventually, Daniel, the exile from Jerusalem, he is brought in to hear the dream, and it is explained to him. And all of a sudden, as Daniel is hearing this dream, Nebuchadnezzar sees that he's getting upset by it. And, and he says, don't let this bother you, it's okay. But Nebuchadnezzar thinks this dream is about somebody else, but Daniel, he knows better. So after Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> gives this dream to Daniel, Daniel says in verse 22, you're the tree that's about to get cut down to size. And then in Daniel 4.25, Daniel says, you will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle, and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. And he gives them to anyone he wishes. In other words, you're going to live like an animal. And life's going to fall apart for you until you get this fact clear. There is a God, and you are not him. Life is not going to work out for you. You're going to go lower than you ever thought imaginable or possible until you realize that there is a God and you are not Him. And when you figure that out, Nebuchadnezzar, then you can return to power. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he listens, he hears all of this, but guess what? He just blows it off. He just blows it off. Well, I just want to ask some questions in light of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Because I think how we answer them will reveal whether or not we have Nebuchadnezzar's attitude in our own life. Maybe we're more like him than we realize. I think our answers to these questions will help us to see if maybe the God of me is more prevalent than we think. And we need to do something about it. So why do you do what you do? Because you see, for King Nebuchadnezzar, his whole life was motivated by his own glory. It was motivated by his desire to impress other people around him. And so in Daniel chapter 3, we read of King Nebuchadnezzar putting up a huge statue and making everyone who doesn't want to die bow down to it. And so, of course, everyone bows down because they don't want to die. Now, we don't know what this statue image was, whether it was an image of him or Nebuchadnezzar or whether it was some pagan god but it was all about demonstrating his power so that people would know he was in charge. And on another occasion, because he was so desperate to impress one of his wives, King Nebuchadnezzar built one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. You ever hear of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar, this guy, is the one who did that. 
and he's constantly trying to prove himself. It was all about his glory. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 29, we see him kind of walking on the roof of his royal palace, and he's taking in all this beauty and majesty, and he's liking it. But why do you do what you do? I don't mean just work, but why do you wear what you wear? Why do you live where you live? Why do you drive what you drive? Why do you go to school? What, and what are you going to school for? Why, why do you sit with the people you sit with? Because you see, for many of us, our whole lives are aligned around impressing other people, just like Nebuchadnezzar. And the motivation for many of us is our own majesty. And of course, we don't use that language, do we? But isn't that often why we do what we do? Here's another question to consider. What's the source of my strength and success? You see, Nebuchadnezzar gave all the credit for success to himself, to his own power. Look at verse 30. He says, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. That's how the kingdom of Babylon came into being according to his way of thinking. He's looking down on his kingdom and he's saying, I did this. This is my power. And you know when we pursue greatness through self-empowerment and, and then we give ourselves the credit, we have officially at that moment become our own God. That is the definition of idolatry. We take the glory that rightfully belongs to God and we put it upon ourselves. And I think it's kind of ironic because, you know, we give God glory for when things don't go well, right? When things, when things go well, we take the credit for it. But when things don't go well, we, we give God the credit for that. One guy, he went to the store on a really windy day, and the wind gusts were so violent that they about knocked him over. And so he, he gets into the parking lot of this store, and he just starts to open his door, and the wind grabs hold of that door like a sail. You ever have that happen? Rip that door right out of his hand, bam, right into the car next to him. Did some damage, took some paint off, put a little dent in there. And so he's sitting there, and he, and he waits for the owner, and the owner of the vehicle comes back, and, and they exchange insurance information. And now he's, he's thinking about how this is all his fault, and, you know, he's, he's worried because now his, the cost for his insurance rates are going to go up, and he's just kind of not feeling too good about this whole ordeal. But then when he goes and he tells his insurance agent what happened, the insurance agent says, oh, don't worry, this isn't your fault. He says, this is what we call an act of God. <laughs> and, and the guy is like, so this is God's fault? And the agent goes, yeah, this is God's fault. He's like, oh, okay, God did this then. <laughs> and it's ironic, isn't it? We, we give God the credit for everything that goes wrong. We, we blame him for it. Why, God? Why are you doing this to me? And we use that term act of God as long as it's a reference to, you know, something like a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake. It's an act of God. But if it's a blessing, if, if it's goodness, if it's some kind of prosperity, then we tend to be the ones that take credit for that. We say, look what I've done. And, and this is how King Nebuchadnezzar thought. This is how he saw everything. Habakkuk, another prophet of the time, explains people like this, and he, he puts it this way. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 11. He says, they sweep past like the wind, and they go on, guilty people, whose own strength is their God. So in other words, they look to their own strength to be their source of power, to put all the pieces back together again, to help them get through the struggle. And Habakkuk says, you know what? They are going to be here for a moment, but pretty quickly they're just going to be blown away. And Nebuchadnezzar was one of these people who relied on his own strength, and he saw himself as the secret of all his success. Well, the last question to consider is this. What's the purpose of your life? What is it that you're really chasing after? We've been talking about this over the last few weeks. We saw this in Solomon. We've seen this in the lives of, of many people to whom the prophets were preaching. And now we see it in Nebuchadnezzar, the pursuit of their life was really trying to find happiness. They pursued happiness. They chased happiness. I mean, think about this. How else do you end up with a 630,000 square foot home, right? 
I mean, it's like he got to always be adding on. Let's see, another 100,000 square feet, then I'll be happy. Yeah, let's do this. And, and you know, that's kind of what happens when you pursue happiness as your God. One of the rights of Americans in the Constitution is, is, is the pursuit of happiness. But did you ever notice the harder you chase after happiness, the harder you pursue it, the faster it seems to run away from you? It's like, if I only had this, I'd be happy. Then you get it. It's like, if I only had this, then I'd be happy. And there's always something else. And we're always consuming. And we, we make, when you make happiness your God, it seems to rob you of that happiness that you want most. And you just find that you're always hungry. You're always wanting more. You're never satisfied. No matter how much you eat, no matter how much you consume, no matter what you get. A couple of Fridays ago, my family and I were watching the TV news program 2020. Any of you ever see 2020 on TV? Well, during one of the segments, or during this particular segment, they aired a story about a 14-year-old girl named Hannah Wilkinson. And she has a rare condition called prater willi syndrome. And it involves some kind of a flaw in the chromosome that controls the hunger center of the hypothalamus. It's that part of the brain that lets you know when you're hungry and then it lets you know when you're full. And, and apparently, this affects about 15,000 people worldwide. Now, how this works is every waking minute of Hannah's life is filled with intense hunger because her brain can't tell her that she's full. Even after eating a full course meal, her mother will take away her, her finished plate and Hannah will look at her and she'll say, Mom, I'm hungry. And as a result, at 14 years old, Hannah weighs 350 pounds. And it was just kind of heartbreaking to watch her struggle through this on the TV and her family literally has to lock up the refrigerator and they have to lock the food pantry because if they didn't, Hannah would eat and eat and eat and she wouldn't stop until she died. It, it's something that she can't help. It just never turns off. Now that's a physical disorder that's somewhat rare, you know, 15,000 people around the world when you consider the population, but I think it's a spiritual disorder that's quite common. Spiritually and mentally and emotionally, we eat and we eat and we eat and we consume and we consume, but we're never really satisfied. You know what I'm saying? And many of us, were dying, but it's not because we're starving to death, it's because we're just consuming so much and we just keep on eating and we're looking for satisfaction and we keep trying to find fulfillment in all these different ways and nothing ever works. So we eat even more. And then we find that we're still hungry. That was Nebuchadnezzar's story. That was his problem. But you know, he's heading for this encounter with the real God, the only one who can really give happiness, the only one who can really bring satisfaction to his life. Nebuchadnezzar, he's tried to force it, he's tried to build it, he's tried to conquer it, he's tried to buy it. Nothing has worked for him. And so Daniel tells the king, he says, look, you're going to live your life as a beast in the wilderness. You're going to chew on grass like a dumb cow. But he doesn't stop there, because according to verse 27, he also tells the king what he needs to do. And Daniel says, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. And, you know, saying this to the king who just conquered your people, who just destroyed your land, you need to repent of your sin. You need to renounce your wickedness. That's kind of bold, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I just love this about Daniel, his courage to just kind of tell it like it is. He, he has the answer. And, and so he just puts it out there. But again, King Nebuchadnezzar, he blows it off. And not surprisingly, I think, because when the God of me is sitting on the throne of your heart, that God will always be whispering things to you like, you know what, the rules don't apply to you. You'll never experience any problems with this. You'll never get caught. You can keep on acting like you want to act. There's not going to be any repercussions. You can keep on treating people like you want to treat them, and there will never be any consequences. But then there always comes that moment of honesty and truth, doesn't it, eventually? 
And, and there's this moment of honesty in Daniel chapter 4, verses 33 and 34, where we read about Nebuchadnezzar's transformation and then his salvation. This is what it says. He was driven away from people and he ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. You got to picture this. Nebuchadnezzar won't sleep in his own palace anymore, 630,000 square feet, right? He, he, he'll, he's wandering outside. He sleeps under the stars like a beast of the field. His hair is greasy and it's all matted from lying on the ground and, and his manicured nails have become long pointed claws. He lives like a wolf man for years. But then finally in verse 34, we read these words. My sanity was restored. Here's what it means to be sane. He stopped thinking that he was God. The moment his sanity was restored, he saw that there is a God and it is not him. And so he repents and he humbles himself and he begins to sing worship and praise songs to God, declaring that God is great and all powerful, that it's all about his glory. And so his motivation changes from living for himself to living for the glory of God. And he begins recognizing that his strength is not in his own power, but it's in the power of God. God is the one who gives and God is the one who takes away. And the purpose of his life changes from that of just pursuing happiness and always consuming, consuming, pursuing more and more. And now he tells of God's greatness to all in the world who will listen. But it took a lot for him to get off of his throne, the own throne of his heart, didn't it? And my question to you is, what's it going to take for you? What are you going to have to experience in this life to realize you can't be in the driver's seat? What's it going to take for you to realize that there is one God and you are not him? The preacher went to a state penitentiary to preach to a group of inmates one Sunday. And, you know, they say preaching in a prison is the best place to preach because you have a captive audience. Sorry. As this preacher was talking about his experience that day, he said, you know, there is a level of authenticity when you are in a prison like that. Because these, and he says, I think we all need to learn from this. Because these guys, they come in to worship and they all know they're guilty. And, and they come to the worship service and they're all dressed alike. He says, you know, you can't really impress too many people with your wardrobe. You can't really impress too many people with your accomplishments when you're in an environment like that. And so he preaches his sermon. He gives them this message of, of God's love and, and, and God's grace. And he gets done, and afterwards, as he's visiting with the inmates, one of them comes up to him, and he shows him his Bible. And he pulls a picture of his family out of his Bible, and he talks about them. And then he says, you know, I tried it my way, and it didn't work. And so now I'm doing things his way. And then he added these words. He said, I just wish it didn't take me having to be sent here to put God in charge. That minister wasn't talking to Nebuchadnezzar, but he could have been. And if you're doing things your way, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work out for you. I mean, it might for a little while, things might look good. You might have your own kingdom for a few years. But the time is coming when you will see that you are not God. The power, it doesn't belong to you. There are certain things that you can't fix. There are certain pieces that you can't put together. And now in the pride of your heart, you can keep on saying, I'm, I'm going to keep being in control. I'm in charge. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what God says. You can do that, but you're not going to like where it ends up. And I don't know what it's going to take for you to realize that the Lord is God. But the Bible tells us that when Jesus returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And my prayer is that it won't take some tragedy for us to realize that. My prayer is that we won't wait until the day Jesus returns, but that today we will all realize there is a God and we are not him. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you for your mighty power and for your greatness. And we just say right here now, we are here for your glory. It isn't about us. It's all about you. We recognize that the world doesn't revolve around us. And we just say it. You are the center of this universe. So God, impress upon us in these next few moments that you are God and we just pray that you would allow us to come to you with humble acknowledgement of your power and your might and your strength. God, we pray that you and ask that you would allow us to just put our dependence upon you. So Lord, as we worship you, we humble ourselves, and we lift you up, and we put you in the rightful place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 